the laryngeal adductor reflex, also known as the glottic closure reflex, um, it's really important. It's really important to us who have a larynx, but it's also really important clinically. And it's really important to recognize how it works, what it does, and when and why maybe it doesn't work and the risks. So the larynx has got a number of jobs. The larynx is at the top of the airway, um, but one of its main jobs is to stop things going down the airway that shouldn't go down the airway, so protecting the airway. The lungs and the airway, for example, would be a lovely place for bacteria to live and breed. The bacteria would love it, we wouldn't. That leads to pneumonia. So the laryngeal adductor reflex, essentially, prevents pneumonia, uh, let's look at the anatomy of it, yeah? Here is, well here's an airway with a larynx at the top. So this apparatus here is doing what I described. The larynx has a number of jobs, you know, we use it to make sound, um, but the, the function we're interested in today is protecting the airway. Um, up here we have the epiglottis now. When you swallow, the larynx gets lifted up and down. So the problem is, or one of the, no, the problem is that we have a, a shared intake tube. So this intake tube can carry food and water and it can carry air. So there's a crossover, there aren't separate pipes, uh, which means that the airway needs to be protected from that food and water. It needs to be sent down the esophagus and not down the airway. And when you swallow and the larynx gets lifted up, the epiglottis here, um, as the larynx lifts up, it flops down, it's like a flap valve, it flaps down over the airway, over the larynx, to encourage food to go around it into the esophagus. But the epiglottis it doesn't make a perfect seal. It doesn't make a perfect, super strong, airtight seal. That's the end of the story, but it's part of it. But inside the larynx, if I take this apart, we have the vocal cords, right? Um, and the vocal cords, uh, we can move them so we can put tension on them and then blow air over them and make sound. Um, so in a cross section there, there's the epiglottis, that's the false vocal cord here, which is the bottom of this membrane. And there is the true vocal cord there. There are a number of intrinsic muscles of the larynx, that is muscles within the larynx, that move the vocal cords and they can adduct the vocal cords. They can bring the vocal cords together tightly and strongly and that forms a proper seal preventing anything from going down the airway. So the laryngeal adductor reflex is about sensing something entering the upper part of the larynx and then the, the vocal cords snapping shut within about 10 to 15 milliseconds and preventing anything from going down the airway. Let's look at that anatomy, that brainstem reflex. Whenever we talk about reflexes, we like to talk about the sensory limb and then we like to talk about the reflex, which is gonna be in the brainstem in this case. And then we talk about the motor limb, and then we have the whole reflex. And we can then understand if different parts of that don't work, what might happen. Okay, so I've just put my half larynx back onto the airway, right? So again, there's the epiglottis. So um, this mucosa here, this uh, lining of the larynx, there is a huge number of sensory receptors in the upper larynx. And we have mechanoreceptors, so those are receptors that are, they're sensitive to touch and pressure and stretch. So if food enters here, they're triggered by that, if an object enters here. Uh, and then there are chemoreceptors. So for example, if liquid enters here, those chemoreceptors are triggered, they, they respond to, to liquids and water. And because there is a very high number of uh, sensory receptors in the upper larynx, we've all experienced this. If something enters this region, it feels catastrophic. It feels awful. It feels like, you know, you've inhaled a huge amount of water or something huge has gone down the larynx. It's probably something tiny, but the high density of sensory receptors magnifies this sensation. Um, the same thing occurs uh, inferior to the vocal cords, but there are fewer centers, so this is the, the prime site to trigger the laryngeal adductor reflex. And um, 
the mucosa superior to the vocal cords, uh, those sensory neurons send their axons back to the brainstem in the superior laryngeal nerve and the sensory receptors in the mucosa inferior to the vocal cords send their sensory information back to the brainstem in the recurrent laryngeal nerve. So I think we can consider the superior laryngeal nerve as the sensory limb. I've got one. If I put this back together, here's the thyroid cartilage here, here's the hyoid bone. So the superior laryngeal nerve is gonna give an internal branch and an external branch. The external branch will stay outside. So this is the internal branch of the superior laryngeal nerve going in to get to the larynx. Uh, the recurrent laryngeal nerve we can actually see here and we will come back to that later. The superior laryngeal nerve and the recurrent laryngeal nerve are both branches of the vagus nerve, cranial nerve 10. So our sensory information will go with the superior laryngeal nerve to the vagus nerve. Here's the vagus nerve here, it's running up with the common carotid artery. So it will be running up between the common carotid artery and the internal jugular vein, and it will run up to the skull. Those sensory fibers, by the way, they're gonna to run to the inferior vagal ganglion first because uh, sensory neurons, their neuron cell bodies are always outside the central nervous system. So the cell body is in the ganglion, it sends an axon down to the laryngeal mucosa and then another axon up to the brainstem anyway. So those sensory fibers will run as part of the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve is very busy, has a lot of jobs to do, and it will run up and into the skull through the jugular foramen. And then we're at the brainstem, and specifically we're in the medulla. So the brainstem has three parts, the medulla oblongata, the pons, and the midbrain. And cranial nerve 10, the vagus nerve, is gonna enter the medulla and these sensory fibers will pass into the solitary tract or the solitary nucleus or the tractus solitarius. It has a number of names, but the solitary nucleus. So this is where a lot of sensory inputs pass into the brainstem. Now we have a very nice straightforward reflex within the medulla on the same side so those sensory fibers carrying that sensory information from the upper part of the larynx goes into the solitary nucleus, and then a, um, a relay neuron will pass to the nucleus ambiguous. And the nucleus ambiguous is sending somatic motor fibers, somatic motor neurons, out to the intrinsic muscles of the larynx. They are also gonna pass out with the vagus nerve. So, the motor part of the reflex then, those neurons are running down the vagus nerve. Here I've got a model of the chest, I've taken the lungs out from either side because we're going to talk about the recurrent laryngeal nerve, which is always fun. Now the vagus nerve is going to, oh it's running down here, and then it's going to run into the chest and down to the uh, esophagus and down to the abdomen. Like I said, it's got a lot of jobs to do. The reason the recurrent laryngeal nerve is called the recurrent laryngeal nerve is because it branches from the vagus down in the chest uh, and it then loops and runs back up to the vagus nerve, very inefficient. Um, so what we see here is the vagus nerve coming down, running around the arch of the aorta, but as it goes, it's giving off the recurrent laryngeal nerve which is then gonna run back up again. Um, and on this side, on the right side, the, the vagus nerve runs past the, um, past the subclavian artery and the recurrent laryngeal nerve loops around and passes back up. So on the right side, the recurrent laryngeal nerve loops around the subclavian artery. On the left side, the recurrent laryngeal nerve loops around the arch of the aorta. And then those recurrent laryngeal nerves both pass back to the trachea because the trachea will lead them back up to the larynx, right? Trachea. So here it is on the posterior corner of the trachea. There's the recurrent laryngeal nerve. So these fibers are running in this direction. And now they can get inside the larynx and they're gonna innovate all of these intrinsic muscles of the larynx. Now the light, uh, well, there's a lot of muscles here, but the, the um, 
arytenoid or arytenoid if you prefer, muscles running between them and the lateral cricoarytenoid muscle will adduct the vocal cords. They'll move the arytenoid cartilages such that the vocal cords get pulled together. So the recurrent laryngeal nerve is the motor limb responsible for adducting the vocal cords. Uh, a little bit of unnecessary detail maybe, but here we have the cricothyroid muscle. And the cricothyroid muscle is actually innervated by um, the superior laryngeal nerve. And during the laryngeal adductor reflex, this muscle contracts, which tilts the, uh, the thyroid cartilage anteriorly. Here's a, oh, there's a flappy epiglottis. This is kind of a functional larynx. So, yeah, you move the arytenoid cartilages, you can open and close the, the, um, the vocal cords. But the current thinking is that if you use the cricothyroid muscles to pull the thyroid cartilage anteriorly, that's also involved in bringing the vocal cords a little more medially. Does that make sense? Do you see what I mean? Um, because when I talk about injury, there's some current thinking about that. But, but that's the reflex. So the reflex is um, an object or liquid touches the mucosa of the upper larynx. Sensors send that sensory information through the superior laryngeal nerve to the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve runs up to the medulla, goes into the solitary nucleus. That relays to the nucleus ambiguous, which then drives the motor output, those, those neurons through the vagus nerve, the recurrent laryngeal nerve, to cause the intrinsic muscles of the larynx to adduct the vocal cords, to close them together very, very rapidly so that whatever has entered the upper larynx doesn't go into the trachea. That's the plan. Um, clearly, there must be some other links in the brainstem that also pause breathing. So there's probably some outputs to the uh, respiratory centers. We've talked about those reflexes elsewhere as well. Um, why does this go wrong? What happens when it goes wrong? The major clinical consideration here then is the safe swallow. Um, the laryngeal adductor reflex it might not be completely lost, but that's the sensory threshold might go up. This is common with aging, with neurodegenerative disorders, with long-term tracheostomies, uh, maybe with long-term intubation, with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, with gastroesophageal reflux disease, uh, with obstructive sleep apnea. Do you see what I mean? So later in life, this becomes a more common issue and it's important for the clinician to determine whether this person has a safe swallow because if they don't have a safe swallow, then when they're eating and drinking, there is an increased risk of them developing pneumonia as a result because of bacteria, because of pathogens passing into the airway. And pneumonia is really dangerous, right? This is inflammation and infection inside the lungs and the airways. The other bit we talk about, <laughs> probably because it makes a good exam question, is uh, these recurrent laryngeal nerves here. Uh, we've got the thyroid gland around here. We, uh, we worry about what might happen if, the, um, if one of the uh, recurrent laryngeal nerves is cut, is damaged. Also, because these recurrent laryngeal nerves come from the chest, pathology in the chest can compress these nerves and cause the same problems. But um, if one of the recurrent laryngeal nerves doesn't work, then that means that the uh, intrinsic muscles of the larynx on that side won't work either, which means you won't be able to adduct those two vocal cords fully. You'll be able to move one just fine, but the other one you won't be able to fully adduct. But this is why I was talking about the cricothyroid muscle. That will still work because that's innervated by the superior laryngeal nerve. And that will still work on both sides and will pull the thyroid cartilage anteriorly, stretching the vocal cords. And that, it, that will probably, I think the current thinking is that that helps bring the vocal cord on the injured side towards the midline. So again, it's not a great seal, but you might see that happening if you're initiating a laryngeal adductor reflex test um, inside the larynx. Because it's so sensitive, you can just blow a puff of air 
from an endoscope or something uh, onto the mucosa here and that'll trigger that reflex to occur. All right, um, some pretty solid anatomy. It's always good to have a bit more vagus nerve, right? We build up our understanding of the vagus nerve and also it's good to see how some of those brainstem nuclei that hopefully we're getting more confident with are involved in more and more important reflexes. We've talked about the cough reflex. We've talked about other reflexes involved in the larynx. So this is kind of similar to those, but it is fundamental and crucial to that, that safe swallow. Right, stop, stop talking, Sam. Uh, let everybody go. All right, see you next week.